morning. As I said before, an elite group today. We are going to be the first in the door on the last day. <laughs> Just remind you of that. Uh, a word of prayer before we open the Bible together. Lord God, thank you for the privilege of reading your word together. Thank you for, for deigning to speak and inspiring uh, your apostles to write it down. We cling, Lord, to the truth of the gospel that we find in the scriptures, and I pray that you would make it alive to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, I, I want to begin uh, by reading not from the Bible, but from a, um, a famous passage of... Oh, sorry. Check one, two. Is that better? Yeah. I want to begin today not by reading from the Bible, but by reading from a famous passage of Reformation history. Uh, I want to read a, a fragment of a letter written by Martin Luther to his lieutenant, Philip Melanchthon, in 1521. It's a letter that you may, uh, you may know about because it contains a very famous uh, sentence that has been the cause of much theological controversy uh, in the Protestant church ever since. And this is the letter where Luther uh, declares, by way of giving advice to his, uh, to his partner in the Reformation, Philip Melanchthon, he says, sin boldly, sin boldly. And over the years, um, there has been added to this, this quote from Luther, a second half so that Luther is given credit for saying two things at once, love God, and sin boldly. And I um, have been wrestling with that idea recently uh, and, and reading, reading back over the letter and wondering how uh, Luther was so bold to say this to his friend and give advice uh, this way and how that sentiment that he's expressing there might be connected to the gospel. So I wanna, I wanna read the letter from Luther and, uh, and talk about what it is that he means in the context of our current experience with grace and with the messages that we're, that we're going through in the Gospel of John. Listen to the, anybody, by the way, anybody heard that before? Anybody heard that attributed to Martin Luther? No? No. Really? Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> yes. I'm so glad. I get to be the first person to tell you about this. Martin Luther is justly famous for saying to his people that they ought to sin boldly and love God. That the, um, that the Gospel sets Christians free to be sinners and that they ought to be bold and energetic about this. And uh, the implications of this sentence are kind of dramatic and kind of controversial, right? Martin Luther, the godfather of the Reformation, says to Christians, because of the love of God, because of the righteousness of Christ, you have the freedom and the permission to go ahead and sin. What? How can this possibly be? Well, it's not the scriptures that he's saying, right? A lot of people have come along since 1521 and said, this is proof positive that Martin Luther was out of his mind. This is proof positive that you ought not to be a Protestant, or at least not a Lutheran. I want to read you the, the, um, the letter in its entirety, or at least the, the paragraph from the letter in its entirety, and see if we can't um, get some context for this, because I want to begin by saying this. Luther's exactly right. We should take Luther's advice. We should love God and sin boldly. And I hope I can be as controversial about that as possible. I am saying to you what Martin Luther said to Philip Melanchthon. Sin boldly. It is the Christian's prerogative. It is his privilege. It is his duty. Now I've gone to meddling. <laughs> So this is Luther to his, his buddy, Philip Melanchthon, who's also a preacher, by the way. Here's the situation. Martin Luther in 1521 has nailed his 95 theses to the, the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany, and he has basically begun the Protestant Reformation by saying the Catholic Church does not preach the gospel anymore, and here's what the gospel is, and it has nothing to do with the Pope. In fact, the Pope is probably going to hell by the short road, <laughs> and here is the gospel. Luther gets in all kinds of trouble starting in 1517, up to and including, in 1521, he gets excommunicated from the only church in town, from the only Christian church there is, and remanded to hell for his heresy. And it's worse than that because the Catholic um, authorities in Germany at the time want to find him and burn him at the stake. 
So he is not only in danger of losing his soul, which according to the church he's already lost, but he's also in danger of losing his body. And so he runs away and hides uh, in a spare castle uh, owned by his, his benefactor, um, Prince Frederick of Saxony. So he's hiding in the, the Wartburg Castle in 1521 and um, writing religious tracts and translating the New Testament into German and doing all kinds of amazing stuff and writing letters back and forth to his friends who are not hiding in the castle, who are still trying to carry on the work of the Reformation in his hometown <coughs> of Wittenberg. And one of these is Philip Melanchthon, a fellow preacher. And Melanchthon's writing him letters saying, how do I do this? What am I, uh, what's the Reformation? Um, how is it progressing? What are the issues? Can you give me some advice? And Luther says to Melanchthon this, if you are a preacher of mercy, do not preach an imaginary, but the true mercy. And if the mercy is true, you must therefore bear the true, not an imaginary, sin. God does not save those who are only imaginary sinners. Be a sinner and let your sins be strong. Or in another translation of the Latin that Luther was using, sin boldly. But let your trust in Christ be stronger. Or in another colloquial translation, love God. And rejoice in Christ, who is the victor over sin, death, and the world. We will commit sins while we are here, for this life is not a place where justice resides. We, however, says Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, where justice will reign, it suffices that through God's glory we have recognized the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. No sin can separate us from him. Even if we were to kill or commit adultery thousands of times each day. Do you think such an exalted Lamb paid merely a small price with a meager sacrifice for our sins? Pray hard, for you are quite a sinner. There's Martin Luther to Philip Melanchthon. When the question at issue is, how do I carry on the Reformation? How do I carry on a reestablishment of the real gospel in the world and communicate to the world the true message of the love of God for sinners? Luther's advice is, let your sins be strong and let your love of Christ be stronger. Let your sins be strong. Let me just give you, give you the, the word that he uses again. Let your sins be strong, but let your trust in Christ be stronger. How, do you, how does that sit with you guys? The idea of sinning both. Is Luther, does Luther seem to be afraid of the concept of the fact that Christians will continue to sin? He seems to embrace it, doesn't he? He seems to embrace it. I've been thinking about that a lot recently. About the, about the status of my heart since the day when I became a Christian and became serious about following the Lord and realized the work of his grace on me. And I, it's hard for me not to notice that since that day, since that realization and my experience of grace has been growing, I have continued a sinner. Uh, and I think maybe if I were to say, I've continued a sinner, but things have gotten a little better. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not sinning quite as much as I used to. I think that would probably would be a little distinction that the more I examined it would sort of fade away into nothing. And pretty much it would be true. But I'm as much a sinner now as I was that day when I realized the grace of God for me. But it's different now than it was before I was saved because I struggle in my conscience over it in ways that I did not used to do. Now, this last week, I found myself participating in sin in my heart of the old kind, and I was troubled. I, was, I, was, uh, I lost some sleep over it. And I thought, oh man, that's not, that's not how I ought to be living. Whereas the week before... Maybe I hadn't been 
struggling with those particular sins. And I thought to myself when I examined the contents of my heart, okay, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I notice, in other words, that there's a difference between me, the saved Adam Andrews, and the pre-salvation unsaved Adam Andrews, and that is that the saved Adam Andrews wrestles and struggles with his conscience more than the unsaved one did. And I want to suggest to you that Martin Luther would say to me, were he here, you, Andrews, saved Andrews, are doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. This struggle you have on a regular basis with your conscience is a sign that you have not fully grasped the grace of God in Jesus Christ. In fact, Luther might say to me, you saved Adam Andrews, are the kind of person that Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 2 when he says this. And guys, if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 2, and I'll actually read the Bible now since this is a gospel <laughs> sermon where we are preaching. Turn to Romans chapter 2. I'm going to find it here in my... Uh, verse 14. For, this is Paul writing uh, to the Romans. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Luther might say to me, saved Adam Andrews, when you struggle with your conscience on a regular basis, one week you seem like you're doing pretty good, and let's say you're the, the private life of your mind and your thoughts, and you feel good about yourself, and the next week you're doing badly in the private life of your mind and your thoughts, and you struggle with your conscience, and you're unsettled, and you lose sleep. You, my, Martin Luther might say to me, are in this category of the Gentiles who show that the law of God is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Luther might say to me, that describes you, doesn't it? Your conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse you. And I would have to say that, yeah, it kind of does. And I don't know how many of you I speak for when I say, you know, you wake up in the morning and you say, how did it go yesterday? Well, yesterday I was a sinner, and I'm troubled by that. Or, which is even worse, yesterday I wasn't a sinner, and I feel pretty good about that. How am I a Gentile when I do that? Does Paul describe me in Romans chapter 2, saved Adam Andrews, when I struggle like that with my conscience? Their consciences also bear witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. What is, he, what is the Gentile that Paul is describing there? What situation is he in with respect to the law? What situation is he in with respect to the righteous, holy law of God that says, for example, thou shalt not steal? The righteous, holy law of God that says, for example, thou shalt not commit adultery. How does the Gentile stand with respect to that law? He demonstrates that the law is written on his heart. How? By examining his conduct, whether or not he's been given the law or not. He examines his conduct and something in his flesh, something in his mind says, you did right. Or you did wrong. Something in his flesh says, you committed an adultery and it was wrong, and it, something condemns him. Or, which is worse, Something in his heart says, you refrained from committing adultery, and that was good, and you were right. And he either has, depending on the day, a clean conscience or a guilty conscience. Right? And Paul describes this situation with respect to the law as the situation of a Gentile. The situation of a Gentile. He describes it as something completely separate from 
the gospel. And this is what Luther is getting at when he's talking to Philip Melanchthon saying, sin boldly and trust in Christ even more boldly. He's suggesting to Melanchthon that the situation with respect to the law that the, Paul describes in Romans 2 with the Gentile is not the situation of someone who is saved by the gospel. Do you know why? It's because in the gospel, our righteousness, our standing before the law, is a gift from Jesus that is quite apart from our performance of its dictates. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Christ Jesus became for us righteousness and sanctification and redemption. It's because of the love of God, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What does that mean? What does that mean that Jesus became, became for us righteousness and sanctification and redemption? It means that, of course, our status before the Lord with respect to how good we're doing, with respect to how perfect we are, with respect to how lawful we are, is a substitutionary gift from Jesus. Because of Jesus' perfect obedience, we are declared righteous. Because of Jesus' holy life, we are declared sanctified. Because of Jesus' death on the cross, we are declared redeemed. It doesn't have anything to do with how I'm doing in my inner life this week or last week. Christ is our righteousness. Luther understood this. And so when Melanchthon came to him and said, I'm really worried about this issue of sin, Luther said, the reason you're worried about this issue of sin is because you expect that your, that your performance of the law, now that you are saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, has something to do with your standing, has something to do with your righteousness, has something to do with your sanctification. That it's important now that you're a Christian that you no longer be a sinner. And Luther said, you, my friend, Philip Melanchthon, have got it all wrong. It is quite necessary that you be a sinner. In fact, it's necessary that you stand firmly on the ground of your sinfulness in order to be eligible for God's mercy. Let your sin be strong. Sin boldly. You see what he means? Here's the thing. The only thing worse than a guilty conscience in the life of a Christian is a clean one. The only thing worse than a guilty conscience is a clean one. Both problems are, are completely um, fatal to the health of your soul. Let me talk about that for just a minute, and we don't have to go on long today. We can, we can talk about this informally, but what do I mean by that? A troubled conscience. This, this may be the easier one. Why is a troubled conscience fatal to the health of your soul? If what I'm saying to you from Romans and 1 Corinthians is true, a troubled conscience is a sign that you have failed to save yourself. A troubled conscience is a sign that you see that you've done wrong, and you are troubled by that because whether you do wrong or right is the factor that will decide your fate. Why should you be troubled? Why should you be troubled by your sin if your sin is paid for at the cross? Why should they? And I'm not talking about the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When I steal, I realize, oh my goodness, I have broken the law of God, and I rush to make recompense, and I rush to repent, and I do it, if the Holy Spirit is pulling me, with godly sorrow, but also with joy because of the, the move of the Holy Spirit uh, pushing me and compelling me to be reconciled. The troubled conscience that I'm talking about is the one where we say, oh boy, and I don't know how many of you struggle with this, but I certainly do. Oh, no, 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 I've done wrong. I've messed things up, and I need to put it right so that I can be okay again, right? I need to stop doing that thing for six or eight months until it can be established that I don't do that anymore, and I can have a record of a guy who doesn't do that, right? That guilty conscience right there is a sign that I don't yet understand the grace of God, that I don't yet trust in 
the work of Christ. Luther says, did the Lamb of God make such a small sacrifice that he would just kind of get you out of hock for a couple of days and then you got to make sure that it's that you keep your nose clean after that? No, it's all taken care of forever and ever. Even though you commit murder and adultery a thousand times a day, Luther says, you're still as clean as clean can be. And the sign of a, the guilty conscience is a sign that you don't get that. You don't understand that. I do not understand that. Because every time I sin, quote unquote, I'm troubled. Not just because I've broken the law of God and that sin is a, that sin is a disaster. I'm troubled because my reputation with God is going to suffer. My standing and status with God and with other people is going to suffer. My guilty conscience is a sign that I don't trust Jesus to save me. I'm going to save myself. And I think it's fairly easy to see that point, that a guilty conscience is a sign that there's a fatal problem going on with my understanding of the gospel and the health of my soul. But I said a minute ago that the only thing worse than a guilty conscience is a clean one. What do I mean by that? Well, it's the same problem, right? It's the same problem when I look back on my previous week and say, well, pretty good, Andrews, not bad at all. No major sins, no horrific, heinous ones that would require like public humiliation or public restitution or recompense. Maybe some, you know, little stuff that you could have been nicer in your heart towards people, but no big deal. You're good. Pretty clean. A fatal error, of course. My conscience, just like the Gentile in Romans chapter 2, is excusing me, right? My conscience is excusing me. I have a clean conscience, which means I know nothing that I've done that stands to condemn me. And I challenge you or anybody to find fault. Luther would say, oh man, you don't get it at all. Pray hard, Luther would say to me, for you are a very great sinner. And that your self-satisfaction in your good record bespeaks two major errors. First of all, you probably aren't paying close enough attention to all the things you've done. And so your clean conscience bespeaks that you're not really all that detail-oriented in your self-evaluation. But secondly, the pride of imagining that you are doing okay is a damnable error in and of itself. The only thing worse than a guilty conscience is a clean one. And Luther's, Luther's implication here is that the world of conscience, in this sense, is the world of law. It's an element of the economy of law. And it is the very thing that the life and death and resurrection of Jesus is to set us free from. When Paul says in Romans 6 that we have been set free from sin, he cannot possibly mean that now that we're Christians, we will never sin again. He cannot possibly mean that, or else Jesus was wrong about world history. And we have to take by faith that he wasn't wrong about world history, that he actually knew what was going to happen and told the truth about it. And since he's the God of very God of very God, every word out of his mouth was true and real and corresponds to the actual reality of the world. So he cannot have meant that once you become a Christian, you cease to sin. But you have been set free from sin, truly. What does that mean? What does it mean for me? At, 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 who, at the end of every day or at the end of every week, looks back on my, on my performance, looks back on my record, and either is excused by my conscience or condemned by my conscience. The death of Jesus sets me free from sin in this way, that my sin is no longer the thing that judges me. My sin is no longer the thing that defines me. My sin has become a different thing for me than it used to be. And what is that thing now? It's a thing that I am bold about if Luther is to be, if Luther's advice is to be taken. Because it is the thing that qualifies me for the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. Sin boldly. Stand firmly on the ground that everything you do is tainted with sin and is therefore damnable so that you can rejoice in the free gift of God in Jesus Christ. Pray hard, he says to Philip, for you are a very great sinner. And he, what he could have meant is, by saying that is, pray hard, for you're a very great sinner and you're lucky 
to see it. Because woe to those who can't see their great need for Jesus. Christ Jesus became for us righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I wish that I would know this truly as I go through my regular normal life. That I would know that I'm going to continue sinning in one way or another. <clears throat> from now until the day I pass on to my eternal reward. And that by the will of God. Because God has will for me to never be far from needing his mercy. Never be far from needing his grace. Never be far from the moment when I realize, oh, even now I can't save myself. Even now when, I, when Andrews goes to do it by himself, he screws it up. Even now, after knowing the Lord for all these years and being a preacher of the gospel, for goodness sakes, when he goes off and does something else, something by himself, he needs to be forgiven. Sin boldly. Does anybody struggle with their conscience as much as I do? Your conscience is active. Do they alternately condemn or excuse you on a regular basis? Johnson looks in the mirror and says, oh man, Johnson, you are a reprehensible, ne'er-do-well. You gotta do better. Anybody? Are, do, you have the, do you have it as bad as me? Do you look in the mirror like we've been talking about the last few weeks and say, nice work. That was well done. <laughs> you get all kinds of spiritual credit for that. I don't even, I mean, I might as well just be the whipping boy for that because I do that all <laughs> the time. Sin boldly. Call that what it is. Call that what it is. A creature with feet of clay, made of clay, trying to save himself by his own efforts. God have mercy. God have mercy. And he does. And it's the only way to participate in the kingdom of God. To say that stuff doesn't count. I'm not in that economy anymore. My sin exists for the, for the purpose of driving me back again to the mercy of God. Inasmuch as we have something in our hands and in our flesh that testifies in our behalf, inasmuch as we have something like that that testifies in our behalf and makes a name for us with God, we are at risk in our souls. We are at risk. And Luther would say to us, pray hard. Or you are a terrible sinner, a very great sinner. You got something good that looks really good that you've done, that you believe, that you practice, that you teach your children, that you model. Pray very hard. For in that, you are a very great sinner. I'm going to work the other side of the street. You got something hanging on in your flesh that is morally reprehensible that you've been struggling against for years. Be bold. Sin boldly. Let your sin be strong. It's sometimes easier to see that this is damnable. Easier than this, although they are both damnable. Sin boldly. Be strong. Let your sin be strong. Jesus, this is what I need you to save me from. Do I need you to make me stop doing it? Yes, of course. That would be wonderful and glorious and such a relief to me and all my people. But for some reason, Jesus does not explicitly promise that all the time. What he does promise is to set you free from the economy where that damns your soul to hell. He promises to set you free from the economy where getting rid of that saves your soul and sends you to heaven. By the grace of God, you've been removed from that economy altogether. And that sin, if it hangs on, is nothing more than a reminder to live in the economy of the gospel today. <clears throat> I preach that to you because I need to hear it myself this week and today. I need to hear that the only way out of this world of conscience, where my conscience alternately condemns and excuses me, the only way out is to sin boldly, to make my sin strong, and my trust in Christ even stronger. So, 
I'll say it in public today. I am a very great sinner. And I want to pray for myself and have you pray for me. Maybe I'll pray for you too. That we would be able to see the love of God in Jesus that only comes to very great sinners. And that we would be set free from a world where our consciences condemn and excuse us into a world where we have the righteousness of Christ as a gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we do pray this morning. I pray for myself and for my brothers and sisters here. We pray for each other that you would deliver us from the economy of sin and death, from the law of sin and death, and that you would help us, Lord, to take the opportunity afforded by our sin to come to your cross empty-handed and rejoice in the salvation that you've bought for us there. I pray, Lord, that we would, in Luther's phrase, sin boldly and trust in Christ even more boldly so that your mercy will rest upon us. Lord, we trust you to do your perfect work in our lives and to set us free in time and in the flesh from sin as you will. But Lord, also from, the very, from this very moment, set us free in our hearts from that economy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.